Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we're looking at data and artificial intelligence. For this, we catch up with Pendo Systems, Bank of America, BMY Mellon, and IBM. So firstly, I caught up with Pendo Systems to speak about preparing unstructured data for artificial intelligence systems. My background was very much in the structured space. I was involved in designing enterprise data systems and, and implementing data systems. And we did pull data from externally, but it typically came in some kind of machine readable form, right? It was a Bloomberg feed or Reuters or, you know, it was machine readable. Um, certainly the journey we've been on has been one where we started in that space and we built a bunch of data science capabilities around that space. We were actually taken by the client into the unstructured space. And what happened was it, for us, it was really relearning how people think about data. And it's really, really interesting for us. If you think about structured data, data that's in databases, data that's been put in CSV files, technology have been very heavily involved in that. They tend to understand those file formats. Database models have schemas. Schemas tend to be documented. And there's a lot of dollar, IT dollar, being spent to manage that focus. As we started to look at that unstructured space, we kind of found it into a, a bit of a kind of no man's land, with a, where basically you had a situation where IT were very hands off, they were just documents thrown into a SharePoint site. The business don't spend dollars managing data in unstructured documents. They don't you know, manage schema evolution, they don't know if the form has changed, they don't really even know what data's in those forms. So the journey we started on was one where we went out with a very data-centric mind and said, hey, this is all about us documenting what data's out there and being able to pull it back into a structured form. What we discovered was this was going to be a journey that the business would have to participate in. They'd have to see the documents. They'd have to inter inter interact with them. They'd also have to iterate. And so we started out on projects pulling information from maybe a few hundred thousand documents. We'd get an understanding at the beginning from an SME as to what they think those documents contain. And then very quickly after that, we would find out that they really didn't know what was there. They'd have to see, we'd have to iterate. And for us, what we learned, and I think that one of the powers that we bring to the table is the fact that we wanted that iteration cycle to be like days. So we wanted to be able to pull in a couple of hundred thousand documents, iterate over them, understand what different types there are there, start to pull information, but show the business in three or four days what that looks like, and then let them come back to the table and say, hey, I understand what's now there, I understand what these documents are, and I can see other information I want. So the journey for us was one which was coming from a world that was very structured, where there was a lot of IT infrastructure around, to one that was much less IT-centric, um, and one that the business had to be a lot more involved in, um, and one that went from kind of uh, really thinking about how to plan this and put a structure around it um, and define it all up front, like you might think about a, a data warehouse or a data mart, to one that was much more interactive and one where we were learning all the time. And also what was interesting there was, it was one where we started with machine learning. We realized that machine learning on its own couldn't get these kind of 95, 98% accuracy we were looking for. And so we combined machine learning with rule-based systems, with highly interactive, inter, in, uh, iterative processes to allow us to kind of constantly be training not only the algorithms, but also starting to train people into understanding how to kind of harness this kind of wild west world of you know, data that's sitting out there in the unstructured space. I sent Doug McKenzie to speak with Bank of America Merrill Lynch to find out more about their use of AI. So how are you leveraging the power of automation and operations? Absolutely. Listen, we've been automating um, in the operations space for a number of years. Um, we've done an awful lot of innovation. And when we look at that, what we're looking at is where are there processes that are high value but low in complexity, where automation can really come into play. And some of the objectives that we're looking to accomplish is how do we improve client delight? How do we bring down our risk and manage controls? How do we manage our costs better? And how do we free up our associates' time so they can work on more value-added type activities? So a good example where we've done that recently is in the US with our wholesale lockbox processes. So we've completely automated and transformed our lockbox processing over the last couple of years, where we took a look at the end-to-end -end process. And now if you look at how it works today, almost none of it is touched by a human being. 
So most of those come in and it's completely um, automated straight through and anything then that comes out within the exception queue, that's where the humans come in, if you will, and are able to manage those exception queues, again, reaching out to the clients and being able to get those processed quickly. So client delight has gone way up and we've been able to use uh, BAML patented technology using um, AI, using uh, ICR, OCR, and it's very exciting. I know I went to visit our shop there recently and I think the last time I had visited a lockbox shop was in the 90s and I went back and saw it recently and it's it's amazing. It's it's so um, automated. It's lots of computers and it takes up a lot less space as well. So I think it's been a win-win across the board. Now one of the, you mentioned some of the uh, benefits of the automation process there. Can you tell us some other things that may improve such as security and you mentioned time already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, as we look at, at automation, um, some of the um, risks and the controls, the, the, the data that we can capture, um, that we can monitor, if you think about what's happening in the regulatory environment as well, uh, so much of that is, is, is much easier to manage and capture if you can do this in an automated fashion as opposed to having to do it manually with, with individuals. So I think there are a lot of benefits to be had. One of the biggest issues with data is how to use it in an effective way to enhance the customer experience. I caught up with Pendo Systems to find out more. How can banks work with you to really automate some of their data processing? For us, again, we, we, we've seen a kind of evolving state, right? And it's really been interesting for us because we were originally implemented in our unstructured sense, very much as a kind of tactical thing to, to stop uh, our clients who were kind of having problems with maybe like a regulation and they were caught out and they needed to quickly find information to, to validate either what they had, maybe build a model that was missing um, or address a question from one of the regulators. Over the last couple of years, what we've seen is that they've gone from seeing that very much as a kind of black box where it's just, hey, we, we engage this tool, they pull the data from this, this source and gave it as a nice structured form to one which they're much more involved in. And they're trying to go through and understand a lot more about what's happening in it. And also their hunger for information has really changed. So early on, we saw situations where the client might only want you know, five or six key attributes from say, you know, five or 10 million documents. As they started to use the tool and as they became more familiar with what we did, then they started to get more hungry for more and more information. And again, that's really part of that iteration that we've been in is how do you kind of drive people and make this something you can understand? I mean, it's, it's difficult to express how kind of hard it looks for a business person. So we might start a project that to us seems very simple with a client where they say we have, you know, 500 loans. So that's maybe as many as three or 400,000 documents. And we need to quickly pull out, you know, the, na the names, any addresses, things like that from those loan information so that we can compare it to a, a system or we compare it to what we think we've got in this loan portfolio. That's a hugely daunting prospect for anybody who's just got people because that's hundreds of thousands of documents. That's a team for what could be months to kind of go through that process. Because we're so key on automating and iterating over that, that for us can be a very short project. It could be just a few weeks, right? With a very small group, it could just be one or two people using the tool to basically get that done. At first, I think there was a lot of questions and confidence that had to be built. A lot of that came from people actually using the platform and seeing the results. And then the second thing was them starting to actually understand what was available. And, and you know, just recently we were in a meeting with one of our clients where they actually admitted that one of the things that's really key to them is we didn't we just thought you were kind of a one trick you know pony like that's what you did you just did this style of document then we, we we'd done other types of document they suddenly started to realize wow so we could really go after anything so now we need to actually step back and think about what we can address with this kind of capability because it just really hasn't existed there in the past ai and machine learning is really important for us it's it's a key key cornerstone of what we're trying to do in creating a more efficient operating environment for our activity. One of, the, one of the things that we actually did, we had a challenge within our treasury services business specifically to be able to identify what are the best use cases for AI and then work with third party providers and saying, how do we deliver that out? So the winner for us was actually around compliance validations, right? Using AI to actually 
perform a lot of the functions that humans do, and our largest staffing more recently in payments is around compliance. So if we can then use artificial intelligence to be able to streamline those processes, we think that's hugely important. So what we've done is, say, for an operator to look at every transaction that they do, they gather information from multiple sources, how can we automate that and learn from the prior transactions to be able to pull in the appropriate data to then create a window for the decision maker, which will still be a human, to say, what do I need to do with this? So all the pre-work that would need to be done, decisions about what information to be able to take, use AI to be able to drive that. So it's, a, it's a, an approach that we're doing, and that's just one example of many things that we're trying to use with AI to improve how we offer our service and become more efficient. Here in New York, I caught up with IBM's Paolo Cerrone to talk a little bit around some of the work they're doing at Watson and artificial intelligence. So now, what is the essence of the banking relationship? We can start from well management because I think that applying AI to well management has the secret sauce to digitize the full bank because you can export it to corporate and then to the other relationships. When you have Corporate and wealth management these days, especially in Europe, you have more or less 70% of the bank revenue okay, at the end. So now, if I'm the bank and you're the client, uh, I might expect that you come to me and you pay a price for this relationship because you want to buy a product that gives you a return. You may want to buy a Bitcoin and become very rich. right? Now, the reality is that uh, I cannot sell to you return as a bank uh, because I don't own the future. I make a professional effort and attempt to give it the best in class product or solution, but I never own the future. So really you give me money to buy an exposure to risk, but this is a difficult concept for the many. And even if I as a bank wants to explain to you in details about that, you as an individual, you are used to think differently because you've been into eight years of banking where the product, the return, the alpha was the key element. So I need to be capable of explaining to you something more Okay, they reaches out to you to make you comfortable in having this discussion. Now, this is the meta truth. The meta truth is that um, you typically don't really buy product from a bank. Actually, you do that. But in reality, most of the people want to get into a conversation that gives them a comfort of making a financial decision, of making a mortgage of a certain type, of investing their money for retirement in a portfolio which is 40% equity or 80% equity. Now, this is a knowledge-based conversation. And typically, it's a human conversation. So that. If my digital bank as a service wants to be predominantly digital, the real element that it needs to digitize is not the access to products. That would be easy, that can be easily commoditized, that is undifferentiated at some point. What I need to digitize is knowledge. And therefore, the creation of that comfort, that means the digital bank knows about you, has followed you through your life journey, has remembers what happened to you last year, knows uh, how you are performing during your working day when you buy things, you know, when you make expenditure at Christmas, so on and so forth, and therefore is capable of describing you in a better way and personalize the digital relationship. Because it's very difficult for humans to do the same. How do you do that? Well, you definitely need artificial intelligence and machine learning that keeps on learning about your behavior as a customer, that keeps on learning about the financial markets, things that happen outside you because they are relevant for your financial life and decision making, and that keeps on learning about the product that the bank puts on the shelf that will distribute to you, knowing that the value, as we said, will be less and less in the product and more and more into this augmented conversation. And that's why IBM talks about augmented intelligence or cognitive, because AI is just a piece of the puzzle that goes around the client that needs to relate with a variety of different elements, which are cognitive elements, all concur to the fact that he is augmented as a client to make a decision, and the bank or the banker is augmented as a provider of solutions and services, not just product, to explain is on value proposition. One of the interesting things about AI and fintech platforms is the cultural alignment between the bank and the fintech. How are the banks and the fintechs working together to provide better digitized services? 
One example that I like to look at in the space is, is really the topic of collaboration. And, and I think you've seen some recent examples from Bank of America Merrill Lynch in that space where there's a better opportunity to collaborate and share different aspects of it. And I, I think you're, you're starting to see that throughout the conference where it's not banks versus fintechs, but how the overall value for the industry and, and frankly the ecosystem can work when you bring in the strengths that a fintech may provide around user experience, efficiency, uh, aspects of intelligence as well. Uh, for us, we've had a couple different things in that particular space uh, when it relates to uh, certainly the elements of bringing more of a new design process. And for us, it's really important as we look, we want to be more agile in regards to that process. That's from a development process. And that, that I like in regards to a number of the dialogues that we've had, whether it's with companies like Earthport or Modo, which you've seen through some of our recent press releases, the aspect of how you bring that agility into a traditional process that may be a little bit more methodical, certainly risk averse, and enhance the overall speed for the product development cycle. Can you tell us about some of the specific collaborations you're working on? One thing that's really important for us as well would relate to the aspect of something we're gonna roll out called Cash Pro Assistant. Cash Pro Assistant is a self-service analytics and forecasting tool that for us will bring capabilities around your cash position, your cash forecast, and util utilizing an API to bring that information directly into an Excel worksheet. Most of our customers, as we've surveyed them, will still export data from the banking systems directly to Excel, create their position for the day. So we've worked to deliver that with Microsoft uh, help in regards to positioning. And I think in the overall space, there's so much more runway for the assistant concept. So you start with analytics and forecasting as you start the day to get the cast position. The concept of integrating more around the avenues of self-service, which has been traditionally an opportunity where uh, it's really untouched, like access through things like open banking to the bank's back office systems, more access to where transaction research and information is as well. And they kind of close that loop under the assistant phase with better education around fraud prevention. So to me, the assistant concept as we promote that is really an aspect that's not product driven, much more capability driven, but an aspect of how to add more value add across the space. How are you able to look at that data and process that data without employing hundreds of thousands of people? Because we've done it with technology. And we've taken an, inter an interdict process while we've been doing that. The, the fact of the matter is, is that we keep pushing people at the problem. And few are brave enough to be able to say, can I trust the technology? So as Pendo, in our first few implementations of the platform, we solved a problem in weeks that had been predicted to take years. They took the weeks worth of data that we created and they gave it back to those people that were saying it was going to take years to verify. So it took us time, and it was going to take time for everybody to start trusting that the data was right. For my gosh, how could they take you know, 45 million documents with pages and pages attached and give us all the answers that we've got 800 people over here looking for, and how could that happen in six weeks? Oh my gosh, it put, that can't be correct. So there was the validation process. What was happening is that they were starting to validate that it was right, not once, not twice. We were getting right 100% of the time. But sometimes it was 98% of the time, or sometimes the confidence rating was less because of certain circumstances, which isn't a bad thing. Maybe somebody had to research something. But it's not until the point in time that they realized that they could trust the machine. And that is not a pendo issue or opportunity, that's not anybody's opportunity. That is an adjustment that we're all going to make as humans for machine learning, natural aid, artificial intelligence, you know, as, a, as, as a world to say, when are we going to, when is trusting the machine going to be okay? So that, that's, the, that's what we're facing in terms of, you know, we have machines doing it. That's why we're able to do it faster than any of the consulting firms. Why we're doing it faster than even teams of people, some of the best people in the world, because we've used machines and algorithms, and that's the secret sauce that we're bringing to bear. You know, we've been at this for almost two years. We've been in production with financial data for that amount of time. 
we didn't come out with 100% confidence ratings the first release. We've been able to get data, start training that data, using particular use cases on that data, to be able to get to the confidence in ratings for not only you know, our machine and our marketing, and we're talking for that reason, but our customers are the ones that have achieved that. And we've achieved it on a journey by looking at it in that incremental process. And we will continue to look at it like that. Not to talk figures, but in terms of cost saving, what does that mean for a bank? So, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about numbers, but I mean, the savings that we're seeing are in the multi-millions of dollars as we're unharnessing this data. On the next episode of FinTech Finance, we take a look at regulation and GDPR.